We're going to start by talking about a man whose name you might not know. He's not one of the characters in the Bible that we talk about all that often. And this man's name was Bezalel. Now, I don't know what his parents were thinking when they named him Bezalel. And if anybody in here is named Bezalel by chance, I tried to make sure there wasn't anyone. But if there is, I'm sorry for offending you. But that's not the name that we would typically use. In Exodus chapter 31, we read about this man named Bezalel. This is Bezalel, the son of Uri. And in Exodus 31, the Lord spoke to Moses. This is while the children of Israel were in the wilderness. And they were there around the mountain of Sinai. God had given them the law. You might know the Ten Commandments. All that was going on. And God speaks to Moses and says in Exodus 31 and verse 2, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom, in understanding, in knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship, to design artistic works, to work in gold and silver and bronze, and cutting jewels for setting, and carving wood, and to work in all manner of workmanship. And I, indeed, I have appointed with him Aholiab, the son of Ahizamech, of the tribe of Dan. And I have put wisdom into the hearts of all the gifted artisans, that they may make all that I have commanded you. And then God goes on to describe what they were going to make. And he describes in detail the tabernacle and the different instruments and artifacts and the way it would be constructed. What God says about this man named Bezalel is that God chose him specifically to do this job. You see, the tabernacle needed to be built, and God wanted someone to build it. And so he went, and he called Bezalel. And he equipped Bezalel, and he gave him the ability, the wisdom, and the knowledge that he needed to do the work that God wanted him to do. Now, you might not have known Bezalel's name. It might not be a name you remember. It might be one that sticks in your mind for the rest of your life. But Bezalel had a job to do, and God equipped him to do it. And the truth is, each one of us in the church today also have a job to do. When God designed the church, he made it so that every member has a role within the body. Every person who wants to be part of the church, who calls himself a Christian, and who wants to serve God, has a role to fill within the body of Christ. And what we learn from this man named Bezalel is that God equips us, he prepares us, and he helps us to fulfill the role that he wants us to do. Now, we may not be as fortunate as Bezalel for God to speak down from heaven and say, you know, here's your name, and I'm going to call you Jesse Lee, I'm going to call you Curtis, I'm going to call you Kelly, and say, here's what your job is, and here's how I've made you to do it. We might not be that lucky. But we have all been called by God as Christians. Ephesians 4 and verse 1 says, Walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. When we accept the name of Christ and we become Christians, God is calling us not just to spend the rest of our lives calling ourselves Christians, but to do something, to work and to serve. We have a calling just like Bezalel did. You do have a role within the body of Christ. So this morning, we're talking about how to find your role. How do you know what it is that you are supposed to do to help the church? How do you figure out what your place is in the body of Christ? And we're going to talk about three very simple things. First thing to do is know yourself. Know yourself. Second, grow yourself. And third, give yourself. Three very simple things. Let's talk first about knowing yourself. God has given you a set of talents. God has given you a set of abilities that you have, and you are different from everyone else. You are a unique person. No one else has the exact same skill set and knowledge and experiences in life that you do. You are different. And God equips us for the work he calls us to do. 
We learn that from Bezalel. You might also be familiar with the parable of the talents. God, in the, ma the master in that story, gave to each of his servants a set number of talents, which was an ancient unit of measurement, of money. And he gave them to one servant ten talents. He gave to another five talents. He gave to another one talent. And God expected them to use what he gave them in order to serve. The master went away, and when he came back, he received from the ten talents ten more talents that the servant had earned. The five-talent man only earned five talents. And yet to both of them, the master said, well done, good and faithful servant. You see, God doesn't look at us and judge how much we're able to do compared to anyone else. He looks at what he's given us and says, I need that from you in return. The five-talent servant didn't have to produce ten talents worth. He just had to do what God equipped him and gave him to do. Each one had their own role. The one-talent servant, who if you remember the story, didn't do anything with it at all. The one-talent servant wasn't expected to earn back five or ten talents. He was simply expected to use what God had given him. And so if we're going to serve God, we need to first know ourselves. We need to know who we are and what we have to offer. Too often we end up playing the comparison game with spiritual service. And we say, you know, I look at me and I compare myself to someone else and, you know, maybe they seem like they have it all made. They have everything they need to serve the church. They're capable. Maybe they're serving in public ways. Maybe it's a guy who leads singing and you think, oh, I can't do that. A guy who stands up and preaches and you're like, I could never do that. I'm scared to talk in front of anyone. Maybe it's someone who's really good at going and talking to someone who's not a Christian and studying the Bible with them. And you're like, I'm afraid to do that. And I don't even know what would say. I don't know if I know enough. If we always start by playing the comparison game in spiritual service, we'll find we often end up limiting ourselves. We say, you know what? I'm not like them, so I can't serve. But the truth is God doesn't expect us to serve like anyone else. He calls us to serve based on what he's given to us. God didn't look at Bezalel there in the book of Exodus and say, you know what? You don't have the same skill set as Moses and Aaron, so you can't serve the people of Israel. Moses and Aaron were the public figures, but Bezalel's job was just as important. God gave him the ability to craft artistically and called him to work on building the tabernacle. God gives us each a role to play, and we have to know what that role is. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul talks about the church as being a body. And if you think about your body, your body has different parts that have different functions. And every part of your body is important. If you were missing your legs, that would limit what you could do. Just like missing your arms or being blind would limit what you can do. And Paul says there in 1 Corinthians 12, kind of humorously, you know, the foot can't look at the hand and say, because I'm not a hand, I'm not important to the body. And the hand can't look at the eye and say, you know what, I'm way better than you because my function is so much more important than yours. It doesn't work that way. Every part of the body has a role to play and is important. And that's how Paul describes the church. Every member of the church, young and old, wherever they're from, whatever their background is, when we become part of the body of Christ, we have a role to play in the church. And we have to know what that is. If we're a hand trying to do the role of the eye, and we're, we're trying to do someone else's job that we're not equipped or called for, then we're going to quickly find we don't feel like we're capable of service because we're comparing ourselves to someone else and their job. We have to know ourselves first. Younger people do have a place in the body of Christ. You may know 1 Timothy 4 and verse 12. 1 Timothy 4 and verse 12 says, Let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Let no one despise your youth. That is, let no one look down on you because you are young. Now, many times when we talk about that verse, that verse is sometimes addressed to the older Christians. Of, hey, don't look down on the younger Christians. We need to realize we have a place in the body. Well, when we think about what Paul's actually saying, 
is he's not saying, you know, stand up for yourself. Oh, if someone's looking down on you because you're young, you got to tell them. you got to tell them, no, 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 you can't look down on me. That's really not what Paul is saying here. This is addressed to the younger people. Paul is writing to Timothy, who is a younger preacher. And he says, let no one despise your youth, but you be an example. See, the way we let no one look down on us because we're young is by giving them no reason to. You think about all the things that are stereotypically associated with young people. Oh, you know, they're just into parties. They're, they're just care about having fun. They're not serious about anything. You know, they, they don't actually care about spiritual things. They're not mature. They're not serious about this stuff. You see, if that's actually who we are, then we're giving them a reason to look down on us because we're young. What Paul is saying is here is you don't give them those reasons. People may still look down on you because you're young, and that's on them. But you be an example. If you hold yourself to a higher standard and a higher expectation for yourself, that I'm going to be as the best I can be in my words, in the things I say, in my conduct, in how I behave around others, in my love, that I'm going to build good and positive relationships with others, that I'm going to hold myself to a high standard in spirit, that is, in my attitude around others, in faith, that my relationship with God is going to be the best that it can be. And I'm going to be an example for everyone else in purity, that I'm going to keep myself morally in the right way, living a holy life that's good and according to God's standards. If we hold ourselves to the higher expectation, then Paul says, you're not letting anyone look down on you. You're giving them no reason to despise your youth. So young people do have a place in the body. We've got to get outside of low expectations for ourselves. Paul says here to Timothy, you can be an example to everyone else in the church of what a Christian is supposed to be like. And that's true for any young person. There are challenges to being a Christian in every age group. When you're young, you're thinking about what you can do as a Christian to serve the church, you might say, you know, I don't have a lot of experience. And everyone else, they seem like they already know their job in the church. They're already doing it, and they know what to do. They know how to have Bible studies. They know how to serve in these ways. They know how to take the initiative. And I'm young, and I don't want to, you know, step out of bounds and do something I'm not supposed to do. So, so often we wait just to be told what to do. Well, we also have different responsibilities. We have school. And that can be busy. We might have work. We're about to have work, and that can be busy. And we have all these things going on in our life, and we say, you know what? I'll, I'll be more of a Christian. I'll serve God more when I'm an adult. Later on, when I'm getting older, then I'll have more time, more experience, and then I'll focus on it. Well, then we grow up, and what happens? Well, you still have work responsibilities. You still have a career, and usually it's more responsibilities you might start a family, and that will take time and responsibilities and energy. You might have more things you have to do in the community or what's going on around you, and you realize, you know what? I still don't have a lot of time and don't have a lot of energy to serve the church. And so we say, well, when I get to the next stage of life, when I can retire, when I can set aside some of those responsibilities, then I'll have a lot of time and I'll be able to serve. So then you're an older Christian, and now you're tired. Now you don't have a lot of energy, and you say, wow, I wish I had served the church more when I was younger. And I see all these young people who have so much energy, so much talent, so much ability, and they're capable of doing so much. And maybe we have shut-ins in the church who feel like they aren't needed anymore. They feel like they're being forgotten because they're not able to be there because of their age or their health. One of the devil's favorite tactics is convincing every age group in the church that only the other age groups can serve the church. When we're young, we say, I, I'll be more able to do that when I'm older. Then we get older and we say, man, I wish I'd done that when I was younger and had so much time there in middle school, there in high school. I could have been growing so much. We get older and we say, wow, I wish I had done all of this while I was in my prime. The truth is every age group is important and valuable to the church. You will always struggle with having the time and energy to serve. Always. And if you're always waiting to have more time and energy to serve, 
You'll wait forever and serve never. It's a question of priority and commitment in any stage of life that we're in, no matter what we have going on. We have to know ourselves and know our own place in the body and be willing to let God use us. Let God use you. I have to let God use me. If you remember with the bystander effect, if something happens, maybe it's an accident on the side of the road and people drive on by and they see that and they think, oh, maybe they need help. And we keep on driving because someone else will stop and help them. And maybe something's going on, some big spectacle, and everybody just kind of gathers around and watches and thinks, you know what, someone else will take care of this. Someone else will do it. Sometimes that's our attitude about the church and about spiritual service. Someone else will do it. You know, if that needs to be done, someone else who knows more, who's more confident, they'll step up and do it. That's the attitude that Moses had. In Exodus chapters 3 and 4, he was giving a series of excuses to God of why he couldn't answer God's call to go and serve the people of Israel. He said, oh, I'm not good enough. Oh, you, you want me to speak in front of people? I'm not eloquent. I don't know how to speak in front of people. Oh, God, you, you want me to do this? What if I don't know what to say? And what if they don't believe me? How will I prove it to them? And finally, Moses said in Exodus 4, verse 13, Lord, just please send someone else. Just let someone else do it. And God was angry with him. God said, no, I'm calling you. This is what I expect you to do. You have to step up and do this. We shouldn't give in to the bystander effect. We have to be willing to say, I think I do have a role in the church because God says I do. And I'm going to step up and do what I can. Sometimes we use our self-image to put ourselves in a box of what we can and can't do for the church. If I, I don't think I'm good at anything. I don't really know what I offer. And maybe all I really see as far as spiritual service is concerned is all these people who are really good at what they do and they do it really publicly. And I'm like, that's not me. And we put ourselves in this box and say, I'm not capable of serving. Sometimes we do that in the name of humility. Sometimes we want to be humble. We, we want to say, you know what, I'm not, I don't think I'm the best at this, and, and that's okay. It's good to be humble. But being humble, the way the Bible describes it, will never keep us from serving others. Whenever the Bible talks about humility, humility is what drives us to say, I'm going to use what I have to serve others, to serve God. True humility will never hold us back from service. And don't put God in the box with you. We may get this picture of I'm, this is my limits, this is what I'm capable of and what I'm not, but we can't put God in that same box. Ephesians 3 and verse 20 says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Well, that's a lot of big words. What does Paul say? God is able. He has power. He has capability to do exceedingly so much more than, abundantly so much more than all that we ask or think. Paul is saying if you can ask God for it, if you can pray about it, God's capable of doing so much more. If you can think it, if you can imagine it, Paul is reminding us, yes, God is capable of doing so much more. But that's not the end of the verse. According to the power that works in us. Paul says all this power that we know God has, that's so much more than we can even imagine, it works in us as Christians. You know, it's just a couple verses later when he says, walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. We can't put God in the box with us and say, here's my limits. Here's what I can and can't do. We have to say, God, you can use me however you want. And then we should just watch and wait to see what God can do. How do we know ourselves? How do we learn who we are and what our place is in the body? Three questions to ask yourself. And I didn't come up with these. They were asked me, I think, five years ago. And I've been thinking about them ever since, and they've guided me ever since. And these aren't the kind of questions where you just write them down and answer them and say, well, we're done. I got it all made. These are questions you take some time, reflect on, 
think on and figure it out as you grow. First question, ask yourself, what am I really good at? What am I really good at? That may be a hard question to answer if we're still thinking of humility in a pretty bad way like sometimes we do. Of, I, I don't want to say I'm good at anything. I need to be humble. Again, humility doesn't keep us from recognizing what we can do well. It's just about using what we can do to serve others instead of for our own gain or benefit. It should drive us to serve God with what we have. So ask yourself, what am I really good at? The second question, what do I really enjoy? What do I really enjoy? What do I find fun? What makes me happy? What, what am I doing when I'm not thinking, oh, I can't wait to get done with this and move on to something else, but I actually enjoy doing? Ask yourself. The third question, what do I really need to do? Where am I needed? Where's the gap that I'm supposed to fill? What do I really need to do? Now, asking those three questions will show you three things. The first question will show you your talents. What am I good at? The second question will show you your passions. What do I enjoy? The third question shows you your responsibilities. What is it that you need to do? Now, if you were to make a three-way Venn diagram of those questions, so you draw the first circle, you draw the second circle, you draw the third circle. So in the first circle, we'll put in, here's my talents, here's what I'm good at. Here's my passions, here's what I enjoy. Here's my responsibilities, that's what I need to do in life. The intersection of those three things is the most valuable place for you to serve the church. It's the most important place for you to serve, the intersection of those three questions. That doesn't mean it's the only place you'll serve, there are times you have to do things, responsibilities, that you aren't necessarily good at and you don't always enjoy. There are times you enjoy things that you're not actually good at, or maybe you don't actually have to do. And so there are other things we can do, of course, but the most valuable place for you to serve by knowing yourself and your place in the body is the middle of those three answers. What are my talents? What are my passions? What are my responsibilities? Know yourself. Second, grow yourself. The truth is you must develop your talents. Is you can't just ask this question and say, wow, here's the things I'm good at, and now I'm right there. Now I'm a fully mature Christian ready to serve. That's not actually how it works. Is we have to grow ourselves to the point of being able to fill our role within the church. If I really want to serve the church for the rest of my life, the best thing I can do in my youth is commit myself to personal and spiritual growth. You won't go to bed one night as a lukewarm Christian, someone who doesn't really care, someone who just kind of shows up, and you know what? This is a kind of church thing. I call myself a Christian, but I'm not really engaged. I don't really, I'm not really interested in learning the Bible. I don't really have a close relationship with God. I don't really serve in any other ways, maybe sometimes when I'm asked. You won't go to bed one night as a lukewarm Christian and wake up the next morning as the most active and involved member of the church. It would be really nice if all lukewarm Christians went to bed one night and woke up the next morning as active and involved members of the church. That'd be great. But that's not actually how it works. Is you have to grow yourself you have to grow your relationship with the Lord. You have to grow in the things you're doing for the church in order to be at that point. We need to understand the seasons of life. What do we mean by the seasons of life? Have you ever heard someone say, you know, I, I think a lot about our young people because they're the church of tomorrow. They're the church of the future. Have you ever taken issue with that statement? Have you ever had a problem with that? I, and I've heard people have a problem with that. And I had a problem with that. You know, we're not the church of tomorrow. We're the church of today. If we're a Christian, no matter what age we are, we have a place in the body now. We're Christians today. That's true. But I do want to balance that a little bit. Because here's what the original statement is really getting at. 
Yes, young people are part of the church today, and you need to know that. But in the future, tomorrow, we are the church. Is the older Christians, the elders, the preachers, the ones who have been in it a long time, who are leading the church now, who are doing everything the church has needed to do, they're not always going to be here. And there's going to come a time in the future where the, us young people who are the church of today are going to be the church. That's it. And if we aren't growing now, if we aren't learning now how to do all the things that need to be done for the church to survive, for the church to thrive, for the church to grow, for souls to be safe, if we aren't growing in that now, we might not be the church tomorrow that we need to be. And I think that's the heart of the original statement, with the caveats included. Understand the seasons of life. Yes, it's true that as a Christian, you're part of the church now. But as a young Christian, don't pressure yourself to do everything now. Don't pressure yourself to be everything now that you're going to be in the future. Because the Bible commands us to grow. It tells us about growth. 2 Peter 3 verse 18 says, Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And see, if, you're, if the kind of Christian you are today is the same kind of Christian you are 30, 40 years from now, you probably need to go read 2 Peter 3, verse 18. Because the truth is, we're supposed to be growing. We're supposed to be improving. And what that implies is, we're not there yet. If we were expected to be perfect today, God wouldn't need to tell us to be growing. Being a young Christian should be as much about your spiritual growth as anything. Understand the seasons of life. In Proverbs chapter 6, verses 6, 7, Solomon, in his wisdom, uses the illustration of an ant while talking about laziness. And he says, if, you're, if you struggle with laziness, if that's one of your struggles, he says, go and look at the ant, what the little ant does. Well, why are we looking at an ant? Because Solomon says, notice how the ant Having no captain, no overseer, no boss telling it what to do, the ant goes and prepares for its food in the summer season, gathers its food in the harvest. Well, why does it do that? Why is that important? Because if the winter season comes and you haven't prepared your food and you haven't prepared yourself, you're not going to survive the winter season. The summer season is when it's easy. The summer season is when you could just slack off and say, wow, I'm just going to enjoy the summer. But if you aren't working hard during the summer season, Solomon says, you're going to really regret it when winter comes. As young people, we are in the summer season of our lives. Now, that doesn't mean that all young people have an easy life and everything's good, because we face a lot of challenges. We deal with a lot of problems in a lot of different ways, and not everyone has the same experiences growing up. But by and large, as a general rule, your youth is the summer season of your life. And if you're waiting to you know, get older and suddenly life is gonna become so much easier and everything will be so much better, newsflash, it doesn't. You just get more problems. You get adult problems. And that just gets, it just keeps going. After you deal with one problem, another problem comes up. Ecclesiastes 12 verse 1 says, Remember now your creator in the days of your youth before the difficult days come and the years draw near when you say, I have no pleasure in them. Because getting old is hard. Getting old can hurt. Getting old can make life harder in a lot of ways and you'll deal with a lot more. You'll hurt a lot more. When you're in your youth, you're in the summer season of your life. Yes, there are still challenges, but what Solomon is saying is if you slack off now, if you say, wow, I'm not going to do anything today, I'm, I'm young, I have time later, when the winter season comes, you're really going to regret it. Is we need to be as busy now growing ourselves and preparing ourselves spiritually as we will ever be. So that when the rest of life comes, we're where we need to be to serve the church. So yes, be involved, grow, we're talking about that. But you need to be as focused on growing yourself now to serve later in life as anything. That's what being a young Christian should be focused on if you understand the seasons of life. 
Well, how do you grow? How do you prepare yourself to serve? There's a lot we could say on that. I'm gonna give you three quick suggestions. First thing to do is find a mentor. Find a mentor. Someone who is an older Christian who can help you grow and prepare yourself to serve the church. When we think about finding a mentor, there aren't many bigger mistakes you can make than finding the wrong one who's going to lead you the wrong way. So how do you find the right mentor? How do you find someone who can actually help you to learn and grow? Here's a few quick tips. Look for maturity. Look for a Christian who has been through it in life. Someone who has struggled, someone who has fought through temptation, who has experienced coming out of those things still faithful to God. Find someone who is mature and knows how to deal with life and life's problems. Look for wisdom. Someone who knows how to make good choices in life and knows how to communicate that to you. You see, if you find someone and they're an older Christian and you you get to talking to them and they're like, wow, you know, and I went through all these trials and challenges in my life. And you're like, how do I do it? How, How did you do it? And they're like, well, you know, you just kind of do it. Well, that's not very helpful. You need someone who has the wisdom to communicate and teach and show you how to make good choices in life as you grow. That's the kind of mentor you're looking for. And look for similarity. We talk about knowing yourself, knowing your talents, your passions, your responsibilities. If you know what you're good at and what you enjoy, and this is how I want to serve the church, look for someone who's already doing that. Look for someone who's been doing it for a while who can help you in that way. Where do you start? The best place to start at a local church is with the elders. The elders are there in the church to be mentors for the flock, to help them grow. And so if you're in a congregation that is blessed to have elders and that has good ones, look there and ask them to help you. Ask them to teach you about how to grow and serve as a Christian. They're right there to be mentors for younger Christians. It's part of their role. You can look to preachers, and you can just look to older Christians. It doesn't have to be someone who has this public big name in the church. It can be people who have just quietly, week in, week out, been serving the Lord for most of their lives. That's where you find some of the best mentors. Titus chapter 2 makes it clear that's how the church is designed to function. The older men are going to be examples for the younger men. The older women are going to be teaching the younger women. That's how God designed this body to work. So find a mentor. Second suggestion, preparing yourself to serve, is form a group. Form a group. You see, you don't have to do it all alone. In fact, it's a lot harder to step out of your comfort zone and to grow in different ways when you're trying to do it all alone. And part of the point of being a body, being together, is we don't have to do it alone. And that's why events like these are great, where we're around people our age who are interested in the same things and want to the same things that we do. Form a group. Your friends have a big impact on you. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 33 says, Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Saying if, if you surround yourself with people who aren't doing the right things, guess what you're going to end up doing? Not the right things. If you surround yourself with people who aren't interested in learning the Bible, who goof off during Bible class, who are on their phones during the sermons, if that's your group, you're not going to grow spiritually. We need to look for the kind of friends who want to learn, who are interested in the church, who are interested in growing spiritually and want to serve God, because they're the ones who are going to help us grow. Proverbs 27, verse 17 says, As iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend is that the best way we can learn and grow and serve the church now in our youth is by finding the people around us who want the same things, and we can grow together. The third suggestion. When you think about preparing yourself to serve the church, focus on your character. Focus on your character. Who you are matters so much more than what you do. Who you are matters more than what you do. And doing a lot of visible work in the church 
where people can look at you and say, wow, you're great. Aren't you a great young Christian? The church, future of the church is bright because it has you and you're doing all this visible work that people can see. That's good, but it means very little if you aren't doing it with the right heart. Or if your public life as a Christian doesn't match your private life as a Christian. Focus on your character. If you focus in this season of life on becoming the right person, doing the right things will follow. Doing the right things will come, but it's more important to become the right person. Grow yourself. One other thing on that, you grow with practice. And just because we say this is the season of life to focus on growing yourself to serve in the future doesn't mean you say no to opportunities to serve now. You grow by doing. You learn by practicing. And there are ways to be serving now in your youth that can be absolutely helpful to you. But focus on growing yourself. Number three, as we close, give yourself. The core of service is giving. That's what it's all about. It's about what do I have that I can give to others. Jesus gave himself. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 2 says, walk in love as Christ also loved us and gave himself for us. How did Jesus serve us? What did he do for us? He gave himself. The best way for us to serve is to simply give ourselves. Romans 12 and verse 1, Paul says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. If you offer yourself up, you sacrifice yourself. I've heard it said before, the problem with living sacrifices is that they keep trying to crawl off the altar. If you give yourself up and say, God, I am here and you can use me however you want, whatever I need to do, I'll do. Whether I'm comfortable with it, whether it's something I've done before, I'm going to give myself and whatever I'm good at, whatever I enjoy, whatever I'm needed to do, I'm going to serve God and grow in the best way I can. If you just give yourself, watch what the Lord will do with you. You'll find your role in the church. You have to view yourself in terms of potential. That's how God looks at us. God doesn't look at us as we are now. Sometimes we look in the mirror and we see a lot of flaws. We see a lot of mistakes. We see a lot of problems. We see a lot of limitations. And we put ourselves in that box and say, this is, I, can't, I could never do that. I can never serve the church that way. I can never be the kind of Christian I'm supposed to be. I can never take care of this sin in my life. I'm never going to be rid of this. We put ourselves in that box. That's not how God looks at us. God looks at us in terms of who we can be and what he can make us. Jesus' power is taking ordinary things and doing extraordinary things with them. What's so special about a few loaves of bread and a couple fish? Well, they're very special when they're in the hands of Jesus. That's when something extraordinary happens. What was so special about a couple fishermen we were just out fishing. I just finished on the shore. It's when Jesus walked by and said, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. You see, it's not about who you are now. It's not about how you see yourself now. It's about who you become when you give yourself to Jesus. It's about who you become and what he does with you when you put yourself in his hands. And you may feel like all you have to offer the church is only worth about a couple pieces of bread. That's it. That's all I got. Put it in the hands of Jesus. Give yourself to him, and he can do extraordinary things through you and his church. Thank you guys so much for being here. Hope it's beneficial to you. Y'all have a great day.